We Saw a Thing is a movie podcast about remakes and sequels. We, we saw a thing and talked about it. This week, the guys talk about the computer wore tennis shoes. The following conversation has been edited for brevity. Chris, I have a question for you. Uh-huh. What constitutes a tennis shoe? <sighs> I have a question for you. Why did we watch these movies? <laughs> oh, it is a great question. One for the ages. For a film that is so ridiculous, it is so incredibly bland. Yeah. And both of these, even though they're different takes, are that. There is nothing in either of these movies that made me enjoy my experience. That's three hours of my life I'm never going to get back, Jay. You know what? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to say... That they're my worst movies. Like, Dr. Doolittle is still the worst. Oh, and yes. And still, for some reason, feels longer than the three hours spent on these movies. <laughs> but I am going to say, I just don't get what Disney used to do. Like, why people would flock to the theaters to see Kurt Russell as a zero personality whiz kid computer. I also don't understand the plots of these movies. I understand that a computer gets zapped into both Kirk Cameron and Kurt Russell's heads. I get that. But why do people care? This much. Dude, they, they, these movies are just a precursor for what would become Rookie of the Year, which was a half-decent movie with a plot that was followable. The thing about Rookie of the Year is that you actually have stakes yes. happening for the families around. Yes. There is none of that here. At least in the second attempt at this story, they made the competition something that was talked about early in the film so that it had some stakes for the for the university but certainly there weren't any stakes for Dex or his group of friends um other than I guess keeping them in school I don't know this was like this wasn't fun to watch neither of them were fun to watch I don't understand why either of these movies have the cast that they do there are people who pop up in that Kurt Cameron one that don't make any sense to me like Larry Miller why are you in this man like, <laughs> I know, I know. I don't get it. And and Jeff Garland is in it as one of the government agents later on in the film. Like, Jeff Garland is somebody who is, like, a preeminent improvisational actor. I don't get it, man. I don't get it. Like, was this a contractual obligation like some of the last couple movies we've watched? Did Peyton Reed just, like, have good friendships with these people? And why? What is... Wh Peyton Reed directed the remake! I am going to say, I believe this is Peyton Reed's first Hollywood anything. It wasn't a Hollywood. It was a D Disney Channel movie. This was, like, a stepping stone in his career. Obviously, now Peyton Reed, we know, is uh, the director of the Ant-Man movies. We know him as the director of Bring It On and down with love like the guy has some some decent directorial chops he, this was just a stepping stone that's that's all i'm thinking in my head yeah but it, is it one of those movies where like he just got together with a bunch of his buds and was like hey let's do this like weird thing for the disney channel and like get get some stuff on our resume that's why it feels like there's like recognizable actors in something that doesn't seem like it would have the pull narratively to pull these people <laughs> <laughs> uh well at this point it's 1995 jeff garland hasn't even really gotten big with curb your enthusiasm yet like he is still in the infancy as well of his stand-up comedy days now with that said the dean of the 1995 remake is a very well-known character actor I don't know what he's doing in this film. Well, he, that's the guy I brought up earlier. Larry Miller. Yes, that's right. Sorry, I thought you were talking about that uh, from the 69 version. No, no, because in the 69 version, it's the friggin' Joker from the Batman television series who plays the bad guy who made no friggin' sense at all. It seemed like the original movie was trying to teach us a lesson about corporate interests and how people who are in a position to be more interested about money don't care about people. And that was like the big lesson to learn. But it only seemed to be a lesson to learn when it was convenient to have some of these characters on screen. Like it didn't seem like that was an actual through line for the movie. It's just ridiculous because the plot is all over the place. We have... Like, the first one tells the world that we have a student with a computer for a brain. 
I, I, to me, that makes a, that makes sense. You wouldn't hide it. It's something that the world can look at. And for the most part, Kurt Russell's all about efficiencies and what a computer from 1969 would be. Yes. In yes. 1995, he's just got knowledge that would be given to him by the internet, but it's a Disney Channel movie. So not like the dark parts of the internet, not like the porn parts of the internet, <laughs> you know, just... Trivia. They could have had more fun with that, though, because, like, they kind of flirt with the idea of not all information that's on the Internet is correct. Um, but they never go fully on board with that. And again, this was made in like the mid 90s when the Internet was like kind of this idealistic place to be. And Disney Channel people probably wouldn't know about the darker <laughs> edges of the Internet and the, you know, the chat rooms and and all of the the other things that are going on beyond just like facts and figures. But they really could have played with that and they chose not to. I mean, this is also the very beginning stages of the Internet. This is the. The stage of the internet when I didn't have a report, I would just put my name on something I found online and submit it. I only did it once, but I did, and I got a B, and I thought to myself, that's something you could do with the internet. But now that's something that Dex does in the 95 remake, but I found Dex highly unlikable in the remake, because he was just kind of like, he was just kind of like a weird, like, oh, my mom's cat is meowing. Hello. <laughs> we are recording this while I'm in quarantine on my, in the midst of a move to Vancouver and I'm in my mom's closet recording this and her cat just walked up and meowed loudly behind me. She's, she's probably <laughs> like, who are you talking to? <laughs> So I found Dex really unlikable in the remake because he's he's just kind of like he doesn't really seem to have like a good, loyal, big group of friends like he does in the original. He doesn't seem to be doing anything altruistic. Um, you know, he's not being helpful to his teacher to to fix the computer by going on a long drive like in the original. He just breaks into the computer lab late at night so that he can plagiarize somebody else's work and get a grade that he doesn't deserve. I just found him immediately unlikable there was nothing redeeming about him at all so when he's apologizing at the end to his friends i'm like no why would any of them forgive you you've been a jerk the whole time you've never been redeeming i i genuinely don't think dexter in either film is like i just think they're nothing like i don't think of them at all at least the 95 version tried to give some sort of personality that he was a slacker in the first one, he's like, I've just accepted my fate that I know what I know. I'm a pretty good kid. I live in this utopia. And why isn't, I'm sorry, why is all of the hopes and dreams of Medfield in 1969 placed on this kid when clearly they have a utopia of students? The amount of people who have come together to just be really great friends, that is your selling feature for Medfield. Like you have you have black people and white people and and people who are associating with gangsters all getting along just fine. That's a great point. Is, this is an imaginary college right here. <laughs> At least the rat house in 1995, it was like, yeah. You had slackers and people who didn't care. I also really enjoyed in the 60s version the examples they gave of how smart he was now. Why was he in New York for a diamond cutting? That was so bizarre. Unbelievably stupid. Like, they're like, oh, well, clearly the thing that we can show that he's super smart is that he'll just be here and he'll disagree with some diamond cutter. And then that's how we'll prove he's smart. <laughs> so what do you got? What? Who wrote this? Actually, who wrote this? And what is their definition of a high IQ? And did Kurt Russell in 1969 wear tennis shoes? Because he's wearing a suit the whole freaking movie. I'm thinking he's in loafers. We, I don't think, ever got a shot of his shoes, at least in the 95 version. One of the very first shots of Kirk Cameron is him walking around in tennis shoes. Like, But are those tennis shoes, Chris? I don't know. I don't know. What the hell are tennis shoes? Your guess is as good as mine. These movies make absolutely no friggin' sense. The acting is bad in both of them. At least Kurt Russell's super charismatic in the first one because it's Kurt friggin' Russell. Oh, God, dude, I don't know why we watched these. What? How did this make our list? Well, it shouldn't have made the list. We were basically stretching it because Disney Plus had uh, had the original on it. The original is only 50% on Rotten Tomatoes. 
computer wore tennis shoes. The TV version doesn't even have any score on Rotten Tomatoes. I'm sure it would be probably around the same. These are, but also that means 50% of critics saw that movie and said masterpiece. <laughs> they either said masterpiece or it's good enough. And good enough should not be 50%. Well, on IMDb, the 95 version has a 5.2 out of 10 with 742 ratings. That is wrong. Let's just scroll through here. Okay, so six out of 10. Cute. Okay, so it's not a great movie by any means, but there's some fine performances of comedy heroes like Larry Miller. No. (laughs) No. I I don't think I laughed once in either of these. All In, it's a cult movie with cute performances and cute jokes. This is terrible. Okay, the 1969 version as well. Why are they monitoring these Dean meetings? Why? I don't know, man. I don't know. And why is it that Kurt Russell's group of friends all look like they're in their 30s and he looks like he's 17? Well, that's a good point because he was he was definitely very, very young in this film. I mean, the guy's got the bluest eyes in the world, and I guess that swayed some critics. <laughs> yeah, it's trickery. <laughs> you know what was really, really bizarre <laughs> is, okay, both of these movies take a weird dip at the final act whereas the 95 version all of a sudden government agents are looking for a hacker who turns out to be the 12 year old competition also thanks for letting us know he's 12 years old at the end of the film yes exactly and then in 1969 the weirdness is that the gangsters have to kill kurt russell because he has some uh, processing memory in him that reveals that they're gangsters Basically. So he's got to go. Hold on. Hold on. This is a thing that made no sense to me about the plot of that 60s movie. If that computer is so important to the running of their illicit business ventures, why did they donate it to the school? Oh, because... Cesar Romero is an idiot. It's not like they bought a second computer to donate. They donated the computer that was running their business. The computer that was getting them track wins with horse racing. The computer that was like predicting some of these things at the casino. And they just gave it to the school. Here's a question. Why did they show that the computer was a problem at the beginning when they tried to input uh, a command and it wouldn't work? I thought, great. Kurt Russell at some points are not going to work, but that never happened ever again until he bumped his head at the end of the film. None of this movie made any sense, dude. Like, was Annie Kurt Russell's girlfriend? Oh, no idea. Who's to know? Except at the very end of the movie, before the credits, he put his arm around her, but he's kissing other girls. He was totally making it with other girls and she got jealous and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Are they together? Because I just thought, like, again, utopia of Medfield, you were all just pals. But now you're, like, jealous? Right. <laughs> it made, because when Kurt Russell kissed him, I was like, oh, nice going. And then it's, like, jealous. I'm like, wait, are they together? Because you've done nothing to clarify. No, nothing, nothing. And, okay, complete side note. Why is it that in every movie where computers were still, or the internet was still kind of a new thing, why do the computers talk? All of them talk. All of them. Here we are in 2020, and we can barely get Siri to take a proper command to, like, make a phone call or start a song. (laughs) And he's like, open and close the door, please. Please change the temp. Is the temperature okay in my new house in 95 that's voice controlled? Sure. Yeah, it completely understands. And the computer in the 60s version, of course it has a speech processor. Of course. It's running on reel-to-reel tapes, but it speaks. Sure. There's this great scene where we learn that not only can you get knowledge from the internet, but it also can teach you things and you'll instantly know and understand what those those things mean. Because Kirk Cameron is literally seen an image of footsteps and now he can dance perfectly. Listen, anybody who's ever tried to learn something from a YouTube video knows That's not how that shit works. (laughs) But he turns into Chuck at a certain point. Like, clearly, the people who created the television series Chuck watched this movie and went, oh, that's a great idea, and then just ripped it off because he's just Chuck. Oh, my God, you're right. You are so right. Chuck is the computer war tennis shoes. Yeah, the computer war tennis shoes is Chuck. And and Chuck is a better version of this story. Just go watch Chuck. It's just as charming. There's just as much charisma. And it's a way better story with way better characters. 
There's not just as much. It, there is some because there is none in these yes. films. <laughs> Sorry, yes, I've misspoken. There's no charm or charisma in either of these films, but there is in Chuck. Dude, that comparison just blew my mind apart. You are so absolutely right. It was the moment when he reads the barcode and he turns to somebody and went, oh, that's 89 cents. And then he looks and sees the guys on an FBI list and turns him in. And I was like, oh, he's just Chuck. Okay, well, maybe this will be more fun. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, I thought that FBI thing would come back like he escaped from prison to come after him. No. No, nothing like that. That would have been interesting. It would have been interesting. Literally anything but what they did would have been interesting. I also thought it was kind of neat that like he looked at a barcode and could see that it was 89 cents. Yeah. And that to me was like, well, okay. So he now sees the world differently. It's not just like a trivia thing. And then what's the rest of the movie? A trivia thing. <sighs> at least they leaned into that as a storyline quickly, right? Like it was so tacked on to the 60s version. And at least there were some stakes there to keep his friends in the school. How many people are watching these things? I, I mean, it's not like he's on Jeopardy. How many people are watching this cable crap and then hundreds of applicants a day are pouring in, making this like enormous economic shift for this <laughs> stupid little school? I just don't get it. Yeah, and they make a point of saying it's on cable access television at like four o'clock in the morning, too. Like, this is this is not a thing people are watching. I would say the only redeeming part of both of these films is that in the 95 version, there's a really cute kid at the end who has who looks up to Kirk Cameron as a role model and says, like, I'm trying harder at school because of you, because my mom said you work hard. And Kirk Cameron's got this like moment of guilt and then like leans down and he's like, you listen to your mom. And it's like, yes, there it is. That's the takeaway from this movie, children. Do not think of the Viper, who is the hacker. <laughs> Do not think of the conspiracy idiot friends or the rat house. This is the only redeeming part of the film <laughs> in both of them. The other one's like, oh, I guess I should have put fame aside and really liked my friends because they bailed me out of jail? Honestly, no. It's stupid. It's all stupid. Yeah, their big plan to break him out of Arno's house at the end of the movie is to paint the house. <laughs> so they would have had to find a truck, find all the ladders, buy all the paint and supplies they would need, and then just paint the house. They didn't seem to have any other plan beyond that, just to paint the house. To check if they were legit or not, they didn't call Arno to be like, hey, dude, are you looking to paint your house right now? Because weird timing. They called the company, the painting company. Yeah. And then when Arno shows up, he doesn't immediately think, well, wait a second. I didn't call for this. No. He thinks to call them again. Worst criminals ever. This is such a terrible, terrible movie. Like, very clearly, the remake is a made-for-TV, like, Disney Channel thing. Very, very, very clearly. clearly, yes. And, like, for anyone who had trouble finding it, the original, the 60s version, is on Disney+. Plus. That was super easy to find. But the remake, uh, I could only find on YouTube. And if a company like Disney doesn't pull that off YouTube, then it's really something they don't care about. Because they haven't even put it on their own streaming platform. They just don't. Don't care. They do not care about this property. And you shouldn't. Honestly, if you think back, maybe you're a little bit older than we are, and you think back and have fond memories of this movie, God bless you. <laughs> but they're wrong memories. Like, they're wrong. I can own the fact that when I was a kid, I liked Batman forever. And now I think it's stupid. I can own that. But your stupid kid brain is okay with stupid kid brain things because it's a stupid kid brain. Exactly. It's... Honest to God, I, I do not recommend this movie to anyone. Either one of them are just a waste of your time. I really, really hope that our next selection is better because holy hell, this was not it. Dude, we've come off to Alfred Hitchcock and you've got mail. Are, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This is, 
we're we're terrible people. We had a really nice little like uplift in quality there. We we're feeling good about ourselves. We saw some amazing classic movies that we've really enjoyed. We've had some great deep discussions about toxic masculinity and murder <laughs> <laughs> and cinematography <laughs> and the benefit of shooting things in black and white for contrast. And then we've fallen off a cliff for this dog shit. Are you kidding me? Don't fix your computer in a storm that is <laughs> i mean you can but you may run the risk of having the entire internet downloaded to your brain and that's not something any one needs at all ever although i guess we're closer now with like mobile phones in our hand that can answer any question but you don't want that shit in your brain is that your takeaway you don't want it inside <laughs> your brain no oh my god dude but it is fun always to go back and look at the world of technology in 1969 it makes sense that it's the only computer they can have in their school because it is literally the size of an entire room and it's 125 pieces. I did love when the doctor was looking at his ear and then through the little like <laughs> all he saw was like flashing lights and buttons and <laughs> reel to reels. <laughs> it's all this processing power. But but also like Medfield, you're not on the map. In 1995, with your one computer, like, you're not, I, I don't understand why they thought that was like a success story. Our computer lab consists of the one computer in 1995. Oh, I have one more question. And this is actually serious because I didn't understand it in either film. So you come to the realization that either Kurt Russell or Kirk Cameron are Super smart because they take this test very quickly. When you were in high school and when you were in college, after you finished a midterm exam or a final exam like they were taking, were you not excused after the exam was over? Yes, so that you wouldn't be a disruption. So you wouldn't be a disruption. Is this something people did? He's opening bags of chips and having a sandwich that God knows what's in it because crunchy is all hell. But like, <laughs> I just could not believe that he wasn't excused. You are an adult. I also love in the 60s version where it was just immediate. Oh, well, he's cheating. No, he's not. Okay, I believe you. And they just moved on with their day. <laughs> but also, he finished it in four, four minutes. The teacher was in there watching the class. So... Take the teacher at face value. Also, only teacher in the whole place that seems to like give a rat's ass if the kids do well. I did love the I'm getting up from the table to leave this meeting because uh, I have a, t a class to teach. And he says, I'm going to go weed my garden. I thought that was quite funny. <laughs> that was pretty good. I liked that. It was nice. And look, again, these are dumpster fire movies with just little nuggets in between that you can kind of go, OK, well, not bad. But I genuinely was yelling at the screen, just leave the class and not to say that the nuggets make either of these movies worth watching because they don't they do not and if you watched this movie for this podcast good christ i'm sorry and i hope that you show up next week when hopefully we watch a better movie i'm sure that we will i'm sure that we will uh but it's nice to know that in the 60s computers were all about efficiency and in uh, the 1995s, it was just about what knowledge you could gain for a stupid trivia. And that was it. That was that was the movie. This was bad, and I didn't enjoy myself. Oh, these movies are fucking <laughs> terrible. I want my life back. I know. And even though the 95 version, they tried to make it a little bit different, it wasn't enough. No, again, it was one of those movies where new writers take credit for the same story. And we keep talking about that. Yeah, but at least there was a little bit of development. Like, Kurt Russell had nothing. He was so freaking bland. Kurt Russell didn't seem to be the main character in that movie. Yeah, that's true. It was like Arno. Yeah, the Dean and Arno were the main characters in the <laughs> yeah. original movie. Like, at least at least Dex was the main character in the remake. I say at least. I don't mean it, though. Oh, yeah. You don't, you don't need that. And at least they, like... They they genuinely in the remake were like, we have to show that there's a love story here. But why? I don't know. Because the first time nobody understood that her, him and Sally were together. Yeah, but it wasn't additive to the story in any way. It was like she just forgave him immediately and she seemed incredibly charmed by him, which made no sense whatsoever. They had no chemistry. There's a kiss at the end of the film. Spark nothing. She's also supposed to be the smart one. 
And then her advice at the end when he's no longer a computer is, oh, well, just punch the buttons as fast as you can and then just go with your gut. But also, like, she knew the answer and waited for Kirk Cameron to get it so she could, like, give that to Kirk Cameron because she knew it was Emily Dickinson. Yeah, his big redemptive moment he's earned. Oh, yeah, <laughs> stupid. Just, oh, God, I hate this movie. I hate this movie, Chris. I hate it. Please let's stop talking about it. Next time on We Saw a Thing. Pierce Brosnan, that sexy beast, he stars with Renee Russo in The Thomas Crown Affair, a remake of a Steve McQueen flick from the 60s. That's what we're watching for next Thursday. We Saw a Thing is hosted by Jay Kennedy and Chris Shapcott. Produced by Shapcuts Media. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And check our show notes for links to our social media and credits. And leave a review on Apple Podcasts.